Hello there, and welcome to a brand new creature filled episode of Character Profiles. Hello there! Marvel has a wide range of well-known characters in their library, and today, I'm going to be talking about one of the most popular heroes. No, not him. Or him. Or them. Now I know you're joking with me. Anyway, today I'm going to be talking about Spider-Man, created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko in 1962 for Amazing Fantasy Comics, and the character was an immediate success leading to his own comic book series, which still continues on to this day. If you're not familiar with Spider-Man's origin story, let me fill you in quickly for those in the dark. Peter Parker is a teenager living in New York, and in typical superhero fashion, his parents have passed away, and he now lives with Uncle Ben and his wife, May. One day, he gets bitten by a radioactive spider, which gives him superpowers like shooting webs, allowing him to swing around the city, and crawling up walls. After his uncle is killed by a criminal, Peter decides to become Spider-Man and to stop crime on the streets. There he fights villains like the Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, and the Vulture, among others. Now, like a lot of Marvel creations, Spider-Man is a metaphor for a certain person's attribute. While Iron Man's Tony Stark is a metaphor for alcoholism and the Incredible Hulk is supposed to represent anger, Peter's changes that he goes through is similar to the puberty that a teenager encounters. With the characters in Amazing Spider-Man being younger, the writers thus man tackle such themes as drug use and dating. The character of Harry Osborn goes through a drug overdose, which leads to the creation of the Green Goblin. Meanwhile, Peter's relationships with Betty Brunt, Mary Jane Watson, and Gwen Stacy aren't particularly happy, and one even ended rather tragically. Nonetheless, despite the themes tackled, there's still a sense of fun to the proceedings, and the stories are interesting and well woven enough to make for well developed characters that are worth following from issue to issue. With the success of Spider Man, it's not a surprise that he quickly found his way into popular culture. In 1967, Spider Man became a popular animated series that ran for three seasons and launched his incredibly familiar theme song that has stayed with the character for many years. However, in my opinion, the series hasn't held up particularly well. The animation is really poor, and it's very obvious that the animators attempted to cut corners at every possible moment. The stories are also kind of a bore, and the characters lack the excitement of their original comic counterparts. A lot of people have a nostalgic affection for this show, but I didn't like it at all. The other most well-known animated series he appeared in was shown on Fox starting in 1994. Following on the heels of the excellent superhero cartoon adaptations of X-Men and Batman, Spider-Man the Animated Series was not that good. The main issue was the Fox censors implementing a large set of rules which seriously toned down the content of the series, and thus the writers didn't have the same amount of freedom that those on the aforementioned superhero shows had. Thus the show just became your typical superhero show and nothing more. In the late 1970s, a short-lived live-action series, The Amazing Spider-Man, aired on CBS. Needless to say, cheesy is the right word to describe the show, and frankly, it's a little hard to take it seriously. That said, it was a success in the ratings, but was cancelled due to how expensive it was for CBS to produce. Stan Lee also hated the show and for years tried to turn Spider-Man into a live-action film. Astounding live-action excitement. The super adventure of everybody's favorite superhero. Spider-Man. Now, he lives. Ever since the early 1980s, different directors and studios announced plans to make a film adaptation, all of which fell through. Roger Corman was signed on to make one, and then Toby Hooper, who was then replaced by Joseph Zito, 
One project that went quite a bit into development was to be directed by James Cameron. That ultimately fell through and soon Columbia Pictures acquired the rights and Sam Raimi was chosen to finally bring the web slinger to the big screen. For Peter Parker, Tobey Maguire was perfectly cast in the lead role, showing the right meekness in the role, as well as successfully showing his growth in becoming Spider-Man. Kirsten Dunst and James Franco also fit that role as well, but the most spot-on actor is J.K. Simmons playing J. Jonah Jameson of the Daily Bugle, creating the right comedic timing and gruffness that the role required. David Cope's screenplay imbued the right sense of comic book fun to proceedings and told the origin of the story well in a way that successfully introduced newer viewers to Spider-Man while it was not boring old-time fans who knew it by heart. The action sequences were also well directed, though the special effects look a tad dodgy at spots where it's extremely obvious that it's a CGI Spidey swinging through New York. Nonetheless, Sam Raimi understood the characters and this proved to be a worthy imitation of Lee and Ditko's work. Spider-Man was a massive success, becoming the first film to gross over hundred million dollars on its opening weekend and won the approval of fans the world over. While X-Men helped in reinvigorating the superhero film genre, Spider-Man as well helped in showing that it wasn't going to go away anytime soon. Thus, it was no surprise the sequel was instantly greenlit. Too much. You're not Superman, you know. Two years later, Spider-Man 2 was released, and it proved to be a superior sequel to the first film in many ways. Uncle Ben's advice of "With great power comes great responsibility" plays a major impact here as Peter gives up the outfit so it can go back to living a normal life. The film does a great job of exploring Peter's growth as he tries to juggle both lives, which only proves stressful, hence the loss of his powers. The villain, Dr. Octopus, also proved stronger this time around as Alfred Molina gave the right menace but also sympathy to the character, and his interesting counterpart to Peter. The action sequences and special effects were also improved upon and thus, Raimi succeeded in making a sort of blockbuster that was not only exciting, but was an intelligent look into the mind of a young superhero and the troubles he faces. And once again, it was a massive hit. For Spider-Man 3, Marvel took a bigger part of the proceedings, forcing Sam Raimi to include fan favorite Venom as one of the villains, and the result was decidedly the weakest in the series. Now, personally, I actually like it. Yes, Spider-Man 3 is too long, it's silly at times, particularly when Peter is affected by the symbiote, and Venom is in it for too little time. However, it still succeeded in being a fun comic book ride, and I was at least entertained by what Raimi put on screen. I also particularly like that Gwen Stacy was added into the film, as I prefer her character over Mary Jane, and Bryce Dallas Howard did a nice job of portraying her. Yes, it's incredibly flawed, but Spider-Man 3 still managed to be fun despite my issues with it. This could be the end of Spider-Man. The popularity of the Sam Raimi films brought back an interest in the web slinger to the general public, including the green lighting of some more animated series. MTV aired Spider-Man, the new animated series, in 2003, and the result was pretty much an eyesore with bad computer animation that really deterred from the quality of what could have been a decent show. anyone who dresses up as their favorite animal. Better still, you can fly. So I gotta ask, you heard the one about great power coming with great responsibility? Ah! Whoa, Beaky, don't fly away mad. 
The name is Vulture! In 2008, The Spectacular Spider-Man was released and he finally received a great animated series worthy of his name. Developed by Victor Cook and Gargoyle's creator, Greg Weissman, this show managed to keep the personality of the characters and was well written with strong stories, impressive animation, and story arcs that successfully manages to connect each episode, sometimes even foreshadowing quite long in advance. All the voice actors were excellent and the decision to make Gwen the love interest rather than Mary Jane made me especially pleased. The writers also handled the Venom storyline a lot better in Spider-Man 3, with Eddie Brock being a central role in the series and friend of Peter's, thus making the conflict that more emotional. Unfortunately, the show was cancelled after just 26 episodes, with Marvel currently working on a new series. We'll see how that one goes, but considering the high quality of Spectacular Spider-Man, it's a disappointment to see it end so early. Columbia Pictures is also currently working on a reboot to live-action film series about Sam Raimi. Mark Webb will be directing the new film, and young up-and-coming actor Andrew Garfield was recently announced as being chosen to play Peter Parker. A lot of fans are disappointed to see Raimi leaving the series, but personally, I don't mind seeing another take on Spider-Man. Didn't both Tim Burton and Christopher Nolan create different, yet nonetheless terrific interpretations of Batman? So I don't see why another director on this franchise is a bad thing. Personally, I'm hoping they take a cue from Spectacular Spider-Man and make Gwen Stacy the love interest. And though I know they want to reboot the series, I am hoping they bring back J.K. Simmons to portray Jameson, considering how fantastic he was in the Raimi trilogy. Rumors are that the Lizard will be the villain, which wouldn't be bad considering they had Dr. Connors in the previous two films, but they never followed up on him turning into the Lizard. But we'll see what they do. And now for my fan work of choice, I'm going with every fan art ever created. Seriously, I search and I search and I really liked every piece of fan art I came across. So I don't have a pick for this character profile since there are so many great ones to choose from. In conclusion, Spider-Man is one of the greatest superheroes of all time. He's relatable simply because he's a regular person facing some regular hardships. He just happens to have the abilities of an arachnid. And needless to say, he's going to be around for a very long time. See you next time.